Buongiorno, buongiorno. Buongiorno, buongiorno, buongiorno. Welcome to the Da Vinci Machines exhibition. My name is Mark Rogers, and I'm the director of the Da Vinci exhibit here for North America. Every one of the models you see here were made by third generation artisans at the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci, as close as possible to the drawings and the codices of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was, actually was born April 15th, 1452. He was actually born out of wedlock to a servant of his father. His father was a notary in the law profession, and his mother was one of his servants. As a result of being born out of wedlock, he wasn't allowed to go into the family business. Thank God. And as a result of also being born out of wedlock, he wasn't allowed to go to school. In fact, for the first 14 years of his life, he was let to roam free. You know what he did for the first 14 years of his, of his life? He updated his Facebook page every day. He twittered with his iPhone and he had 20, 250 cable stations and he watched television all day. You know, actually he didn't do that. You know what he did? He taught himself how to read and how to write and how to paint until his father recognized this unbelievable talent that he had and finally got him into schooling at the age of 14. You know what Leonardo da Vinci needed in his life? The same thing we do, money. He needed money to survive and he farmed out his design talents to the dukes and lords and kings of the day, well all the artisans did, to design these military weapons both offensive and defensive. Italy wasn't the one country that we know of today. It was all these different warring factions. Each one of the dukes and lords and kings were trying to outdo the other one with these machines of war. You know what kind of the sad part about the story is so far? What's changed over the last 550 years? Absolutely nothing. We're still making war machines to make money to kill people. Is that insane? But you know what? That's actually a different tour. We're not going to go on that tour today. We're not going to talk about the military industrial complex in this world. We're going to talk about Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was under the auspices of the Duke of Milan for 20 years, the longest benefactor of his life. He spent hours and hours and hours on his drawings, making sure each one was absolutely perfect, each one was as correct as possible. But on his drawings and on his codices, he always left one or two key factors out of his drawings. In case somebody ran off with these codices, they couldn't make these machines of war work without his knowledge, without his consent. He basically designed in his own copyrights to his own drawings. This was actually, he called the war wagon, and he designed this for the Duke of Milan. He designed it one way for the horse and rider to be positioned here and literally pull this into the field of battle. He designed it a second way for the horse and rider to be positioned in a forward position facing this machine and literally push this into the field of battle. You know what? You've already determined you didn't want any one of those two jobs. It was an interlocking gear system. And as the wheels would come around, it would turn the gearbox on, on top and the blades would come around and literally mow down the opponents. Holy cow. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being on the battlefield and seeing this happen? So, so this had a, a psychological and a physical impact on the opposition. But you know what? He was truly a man of peace. And I have many examples to go through the exhibit as I'll tell you truly what a man of peace he was. They said there was another reason he left one or two or key elements out of his drawings. You know why? He didn't really want them to work. They said when he would go through villages and towns around Florence and Milan and Rome, he would buy birds in cages at the center squares of town. And when he got to the edge of town, he'd open the cage up and set them free. That doesn't sound like a man of war to me, does it? It sounds like a man of peace. And I have many, many examples of this exhibit to show you. Come with me into the exhibit. I've got a lot to show you. And we've got a lot to talk about. There are three constant themes to the exhibit that I'd like to bring to your attention. When we get a chance to explore all these magnificent machines that brought us into the modern era that we now live in, they said there's 2,500 of his inventions and his designs and his theories that we use every day in our life. And he designed every one of these machines with only knowing four power sources. The only four power sources that Leonardo da Vinci knew were wind, water, horsepower, and manpower. And what a concept. By today's standards, what? They're all green and they don't destroy our earth. 
the second constant theme through the exhibit that we're going to find. Not only did he invent a lot of things, he updated a lot of inventions. This was his update of the catapult. The catapult had been around for centuries before Leonardo da Vinci, but Leonardo da Vinci was attributed with bringing it up to the modern times of the day, of giving it a wrench and a lever and a rope design that they could pull it, they could crank this catapult into place, and then when it was, was released, the rope would unwind like a spring-like effect, like a, like a slingshot effect, and whatever they were trying to catapult would go better, faster, straighter, and be more accurate. The third constant theme through the exhibit is over the last 550 years, the material has changed, the manufacturing processes have changed, but its basic design has withstood the test of time. This he called the martyr boat, today we call the battleship. He designed a 360 degree platform to be placed upon the top of the boat and the gearing system could be turned by the sailors. And as they turned this, uh, this 360 degree platform, they could, they could put guns and cannons and mortar fire on top and fire around in a 360 degree fashion, just like our gun turrets on our battleships today. What's changed? The material and the manufacturing process, but his design has withstood the test of time. This is the famous tank that was also designed for the Duke of Milan. And just like that war wagon we saw previously, you didn't want any one of those two jobs. You know what? You didn't want any one of these jobs. He designed this tank originally for horses, but they thought the horses inside would get so spooked they couldn't handle it. So they decided to what? Let's put men inside there instead. Wow, what a concept. It goes to what I was saying before, that if you built it exactly like Leonardo da Vinci designed it in his CODIS, it wouldn't have operated. He designed it originally as one bar for men to operate in a rowing fashion. But if you notice, if it's one bar, nothing happens. But by simply cutting the bar into two, his own Da Vinci Code, his own copyright, so to speak, that each one of the gears would begin to operate independently and the entire tank would begin to function. He designed it for soldiers to stand on top of this platform and the top of the tank would be then be lower down over the top. Can you guess the idea where he got from the top of this tank? A tortoise shell, a turtle shell for protection. The soldiers would stand on top of this platform. The top would be lowered down. They would gaze out onto the battlefield, determine what would be happening, and then give orders and guidance to the soldiers inside the tank. I mean, just for a moment, can you imagine the sound and the noise and the chaos that would have been going on inside that machine? He was into very complex designs like this. He was also into very simple inventions over here. He was into weights and levers and pulleys and counterweights. What he was always trying to do was maximize one man's strength, that a handful of men could do the work of 20 or 25 men. This he called the assault ladder. Today is predecessor to all of our modern day firefighting equipment and all of our rescue equipment. He designed this simple counterweighted design where the heavy weight would, would, would counterweight the weight of the heavy log. A handful of soldiers could then roll this up to the, uh, to the side of a, a castle wall on the battlefield and the soldiers could easily adjust this to the size of a castle wall and the soldiers could run up into the field, up, 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 up into the castle. When the Duke of Milan ordered this from Leonardo da Vinci, he said, Leo, what I want to be able to do is get in and out of castles quickly. And this is the design that he came up with. Another very simple design for Leonardo da Vinci was this, he called the excavator, his predecessor to all of our modern day digging equipment, and all of our modern day excavators. Once again, you see handles on it, so that meant it was man operated, it was man driven. So the men would pull down on this counterweighted design. The blade would come around and dig into the soil. As it dug into the soil, as the trench was being dug, it would be on tree trunk rollers. And they would roll it along as the trench was being dug, just like our excavating equipment today. So this particular design had military and civilian applications to it. But the absolute coolest thing, the neatest thing about Leonardo da Vinci was he designed things he couldn't even make. Basically everything that was available to Leonardo da Vinci was available through a blacksmith shop that had to be pounded out. That casting hadn't reached any kind of the potential as we know it today. These are actual mortar rounds from the time of Napoleon that the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci was able to acquire. Napoleon wanted his armaments on the battlefield to go better, faster, straighter, and be more accurate. Napoleon went back 200 years to the drawings and the codices and the aerodynamic designs of Leonardo da Vinci from 200 years prior and copied these designs so his own armaments could be more effective on the battlefield. But enough about these war machines. This behind me is a reproduction of the fresco of the Battle of Angaria. 
The reason that we have presented it in this exhibition is because the story behind this fresco is so cool, is so neat, that we had to share it with you. The Battle of Angaria was a battle that took place over in Italy that pitted the Florentine army against the Milanese, the people from Milan. The Florentine army won, and soon after the battle, the powers that be in Florence decided to commemorate this incredible victory of battle and they hired and contracted with Leonardo da Vinci to paint this fresco in the Hall of 500 in the old palace in downtown Florence. One day, soon after he began, the powers that be that hired Leonardo da Vinci decided to show up one day and see how it was coming along. They looked up and they saw Leonardo da Vinci painting the Battle of Angaria, and they realized immediately that they'd been tricked, that Leonardo had turned the tables on his own benefactors, he didn't paint this painting to show this incredible victory of battle because you know what? Leonardo knows what we know. There hasn't been an incredible victory of battle since battles have begun. Leonardo da Vinci called war Bastille madness. And he wanted to show not what the government wanted him to show of this incredible victory of battle, but he wanted to show from the human side the human toll that war takes on the individual. Over the next 225 years, they covered it up. They put a wall up in front of it. They plastered it in front of it. And 225 years later, they were, when they were renovating the museum, they took the wall down and they had realized they had covered up Leonardo's masterpiece of the Battle of Angaria. Now it's more commonly known as the Lost Leonardo. It was the first time in recorded history that someone had stepped outside the box, outside this government propaganda machine, not to show you of what the government wanted you to see of this incredible victory of battle because Leonardo knows that there is none. Leonardo wanted to show from the human side the toll that war takes on the individual and that's what he wanted to show in the Battle of Angaria, now more commonly known as the Lost Leonardo. 550 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci designed the original robot he had dreams of mechanical knights that could be wound up, could be sent into battle, and a human being wouldn't have to die. He was tall, he was handsome, he was gregarious. Everybody wanted to be associated with him, and all the royalty of the day invited him to all the party, all the parties that they had. And you know what they would tell him? Leo, come by the parties, but bring your robotics with you. Show up with one or two of your, uh, of your robots, and he would show up and he'd, with, with, his, with his toys and with his robotic designs to entertain and delight his audience. You know what? He would be top on my guest list today. He'd be top on my guest list today. This design from Leonardo da Vinci is actually one of my favorites in the entire exhibition. He named and called this design his Scorpion Boat. What this boat was designed to do was on the high sea of battle. This was designed to float up next to an opposing ship. As it would pull up next to the opposing ship, the sailors would extend this scorpion-like hook that would extend out and literally cut and slice the sail of the boat so it could, the boat couldn't maneuver or get away and be essentially dead in the water. He designed A-frames for the rowers. As the rowers got closer and closer to the boat, if they were getting shot with arrows or getting hurdles with missiles of some sort, they'd be somewhat protected. You know why this is my favorite exhibition in the entire exhi uh, exhibit? Is can you imagine on the high sea of battle and you're in an opposing ship, way off in the distance, you see the this sh this ship slowly coming at you. As it gets closer and closer and closer to you, you begin to talk among your shipmates and you begin to think and begin to say to each other, what is this thing? And as it gets closer and closer to you, as it pulls up next to your boat and you see this scorpion-like hook extend out, all of a sudden it dawns on you and your shipmates that what? that they sent this thing to destroy you. And then the chaos that would have broken out aboard that ship. Leonardo da Vinci's first passion in life was obviously painting, but his second passion was flight. He wanted to fly like a bird from the beginning of time. We've all wanted to fly like a bird. He studied birds and bats and wings and flight patterns of all sizes and shapes and dimensions. On the flight display is the closest design that he came to physically mimicking a bird in flight. This was his bat wing glider. Now keep in mind, he didn't have all the bugs worked out of all of his inventions. He theoretically thought it would operate by the glider pilot's head would go through the opening. The glider pilot would hold on to either side in an attempt to manipulate the wing in flight. <laughs> yeah, right, huh? The Museum of Leonardo da Vinci in Florence actually has another name for this design over in Florence. You know what they call it? The decapitator. Because as soon as this thing hit the ground, your head came off. This is where Saturday Night Live meets the Renaissance, I like to say, because you know what we need for this invention? 
more volunteers. Because the first five didn't fare so well, if you know what I mean. But in all of his writings and his codices and his notes, he theorized, and he theorized correctly, that for men to fly and to fly safely, that your wings had to be parallel at all times to the horizon. He designed the original inclimeter. The inclimeters above our boats and our planes today are highly computerized with gyroscopes and lasers. But this very simple design would simply tell the glider pilot that, hey, your wings aren't parallel to the horizon. He designed it to be in a glass bell so it wouldn't be affected by wind currents. He designed it to be on the glider in flight with the pilot. So in flight, the glider pilot could look over, determine if his wings were or were not parallel, and know to bring his wings back parallel to the horizon. You know what this was? The first onboard instrument, 500 years ahead of his time. This is probably Leonardo da Vinci's most famous aerodynamic design. He called it his air screw. You've seen it a thousand times in commercials and cartoons, but most people don't know how he actually intended it to operate. How he actually intended this machine to operate is the men would stand on this platform, hold on to these bars, and literally run around in a circle and attempt to air screw up into the air like our present day helicopter. Over at the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci, they teach courses every year to young students. And each year they ask the students to take his ideas and his designs and put them on our modern day inventions. And that's truly what the one student did. The one student positioned the air screw on top of our present day helicopter, which it was truly meant to be. Hey, I got a question. Did this thing work? Nah, it didn't work. There's a thousand reasons we know today why this wouldn't have worked. It was too heavy, the men would wear out. But the idea was he was using manpower and air as an element to achieve and perform this function. Leonardo da Vinci had absolutely no way of knowing this, but you can tell by looking at this design what he was trying to do. He was actually somehow trying to mimic the design of our internal combustion engines and our electric motors of today, where this energy could be set up and sustained and sustained for a long period of time to help perform this task. Think about this for a minute. Can you imagine if Leonardo da Vinci would have had an electric motor or a power source or an, or an internal combustion engine? I tell you where we'd be today. We'd be 500 years ahead of ourselves. You know what? This is another job he didn't want. You didn't want that war wagon job. You didn't want that tank job. And you didn't want this job. He designed these huge logs to be taken by the military on long treks and journeys. He, de he designed these huge logs to be carried by horses and oxen and men. Who'd want that job? And when they got to a, a ravine or a crevice or an opening that they needed to get across, they would construct these bridges with, without using any nails uh, of these huge logs. The army would then walk across the bridge. And then you know what they would do? Pack it up and take it with them so it wouldn't be around for the enemy to use later. What a great idea.